Uh, let's see, are we recording? Yes, okay, um, here we go. A little Bacara there. Um, okay, so I'm Sean Mauer, this is Love and Division, and I have a lot to talk about um, this week, this video. Uh, this is kind of cool, I solved this uh, as a barrel-shaped Rubik's Cube. Uh, I solved it to look like a, a satellite, like a space satellite. That was kind of cool. Okay, so let's see. I uh, a, a while ago I was doing a video about um, World War II and the um, and some of the uh, British um, people who knew that the Germans were not the bad people in that war that, that, that it was not Churchill interesting thing about Churchill he he originally was aware of the uh, international Jewish influence and um, was trying to expose it um, but um, he had a lavish lifestyle and he was going broke and the same people that he, <laughs> he was criticizing bailed him out uh, for a price, he had to um, make sure that uh, they s didn't um, make peace with Germany, and they provoked the war, and so forth. And then they they turned down every um, every peace offering that the, that the Germans had made. Uh, world War Two. Now, I mean, my summation is that um, uh, Hitler, the Germans, they wanted to get rid of the Marxists out of Europe and and that was about the extent of it there was just um, a purge of Marxists and um, I think that um, had they won the, you know the world would have been a better place I, I um, think that that um, is unfortunate and I think that the it's this timing thing because I, you know as a Christian I believe that um, the biblical prophecies and so forth and that um, although he was in, in the right, it just the time wasn't, the timing was wrong. Um, and, but I think that timing, the time for the Marxist purge of the West is um, coming uh, upon us. It's imminent. Um, and um, it's going to have a way of fulfilling biblical prophecy um, there is uh, these overall theme um, in end time prophecy that the um, the Jews uh, who actually are the leaders of Israel um, were the ones who rejected Jesus as the Messiah in the first place. And eventually, that's going to it's going to come a, a time when the Jewish rulers are going to um, see Christ as the Messiah. Some things are going to have to happen before that. Now, I don't know how bad it's going to get um, before that happens. Um, but uh, there's certainly, um, we're living in a time now where this information is they're not able to put a lid on it any longer. And um, but I was talking about um, this video somebody had made, um, uh, a, a young man who made this video called The Apotheosis of Evil. And um, it's an interesting, I think it's like a six hour documentary about Western civilization. And, and more or less, I mean, the, the West versus the Marxists. And um, uh, the last segment was really interesting. He, he had um, reviewed some of the um, people, uh, British and American um, uh, National Socialists, uh, sympathizers, and, and people who, sympathizers who, um, Understood, you know, like General George Patton did, you know, but these guys were way ahead of Patton. Um, 
so I got some of the names of this guy, George Lincoln Rockwell. I, I think he might have been the, the, the American, uh, the American um, National Socialist Party that had sprung up um, after the war. Um, William Pelly, William Pelly, P-E-L-L-E-Y, -L -L -E Oswald Mosley, John Amory, and William Joyce. And William Joyce. Um, said, you know, he, he died to defy the power of darkness. That was his sort of his last quote as to why he was willing to, um, you know, fight um, against the, the Marxists, you know. So these are some really interesting people that I'm going to um, do some more research on and look into. Um, but anyway, those... Um, I'll save that for when I do the research. We'll do another video. So this is um, the great, uh, the great course is, uh, is a pretty much um, um, uh, you know a matrix uh, phenomena that's the standard uh, Marxist model. Um, I think it's a a company that came around. Uh, to um, intercept people like myself who, of course, it didn't work because I never really got indoctrinated by the school system in the first place. But this is, you know, maybe a way to capture some of the autodidacts and um, try to uh, infiltrate their brains with uh, some, you know, the Marxist worldview and so forth. But um, the interesting thing is uh, I had done a long time ago when I first came on YouTube uh, I don't know what happened. Somehow I ended up with this strange uh, uh, username. <laughs> Just a, a, a random username was uh, Sean M. PWH. Um, and I used to say the PWH stands for probably won't hear. And then, well, you know what? People probably won't hear what I'm saying. But at any rate, um, I had, um, this was the early days of YouTube, and, and I had made a video about this company because they had done uh, courses on the New Testament where they really sowed a lot of doubt. It was Bart Ehrman, his name is, and so maybe you could look up that video. I got a lot of hits on that. was back in the old days where I could get videos with 30,000 hits and now um, you know, views. And now <laughs> I um, get four or five views <clears throat> because I'm uh, extremely shadow banned. Um, any rate, so, so here's a, a typical thing. Here's a, one of their catalogs, and here's a, a course they have um, one book or many explore diversity of Christianity's can canonical texts, and they're trying to show s so doubt about the reliability, the historicity of the of the scripture. And um, for instance, here's a, one of the chapters in, in this course called "In Search of the Historical Jesus." And so later on in this in this magazine in this catalog, they have another course dealing with Christianity, and all, all their courses dealing with Christianity are all of the skeptical form. <laughs> all of them trying to you know, cast down on the, you know. Here we go. How historically did Jesus come to be the son seen as God? Okay, so how did historically Jesus, in other words, Jesus himself didn't believe he was the son of God according to, you know, that it happened as uh, sort of like uh, a, a morphology. Um, and so I was able to, uh, I had bought the course, I bought the course when, one of the New Testament course when it first came out. And um, I did a pretty, I think, pretty good job disassembling their arguments. Um, the argument basically um, the guy is a higher textual critic, higher textual criticism, and you know some of the things they say is uh, in their hermeneutical methodology is to consider um, what's in what's in the content, and you can use that content to sort of date the um, the event. So it's interesting, and using that method, I actually. Um, and came up with the idea that um, the first Gospels, at least the Synoptic Gospels, um, were written 
before 50 days after the, cru uh, the crucifixion and resurrection. And that's not impossible. You can write things, I mean, all the time, something will happen during the day, and by the end of the night, you're already writing about it. You know, it's no 50 years. You know, <laughs> there's no reason to think that they couldn't have done it in that amount of time. Absolutely, I, there's no there's no reason. Um, I know I had critics say that, well, you know, paper was expensive back then or whatever, you know, writing implements and so on. But don't you remember the story of um, uh, John the Baptist's father who was struck dumb because of his disbelief? Um, um, he wasn't able to speak again until after um, the child was born. I think that's what it was. But he was able to signal for when they were asking what, what's his name so he could be called because he knew from Revelation that his name was to be John. And he was able to signal for something to write on. It wasn't out of the question for r average people back then to have writing of laments and so forth. Um, so um, my, th my theory is that the, because um, if you're going to take this higher textual criticism and, and, and this chrono cr chronological dating saying, okay, well, what's not included? Okay, what's not included in the, in, the, in, the, in the content? And say, well, if this isn't included, then it must not have happened before this event because, or it must not have happened after this event because this event would have been mentioned. And you notice that none of the, not the Gospels, mentioned the Pentecost that it happened after 50 days after uh, the resurrection. And so I, I, I can use their methodology and, 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 and have a pretty good case for, for these early writings. Um, these early datings of the writings. Uh, uh, the other thing, <laughs> this guy, he used to say Jesus, you know, it was Jesus was an apocalyptic. And, and, and Jesus used to speak of this, um, this son of man as if Jesus wasn't speaking of himself in a third person, you know. <laughs> but um, I, I think I did a pretty good job. I mean, one, one of the things that they say, these these um, uh, critics, the textual critics, uh, um, there's no way to verify uh, if God is interacting, if there's that kind of divine intervention. I don't know why they say that. That's just simply not true. You can verify, for instance, if the prophet wrote at such and such a date, and the prophecy says such and such is going to happen, and it happens. You, I mean, you can verify it. It's not unverifiable. It's not like, okay, so that's that. Let me, um, I thought this was interesting. I'm just, re just re watching Red Ice. I, I'm going through their archives on um, Weekend Warrior, and I just saw a thing about Breitbart and, um, or Bannon, this guy, um, Bannon, who um, was, using influence and how the you know the mainstream media act as if you know they're you're not supposed to use influence to uh, influence political um, you know opinion <laughs> I don't know what you're supposed to do then because he you know he was saying well he's just doing it the same thing they've been doing all along but I, I, this is interesting the local newspaper um, Democrat Jewish outreach of Pennsylvania Okay, and so I'm going to read a little bit of this article. Um, this is um, it's a couple months old here, but it, um, this was a, a letter they wrote. They had put together for our representative and um, Honorable Brian Fitzpatrick. Dear Congressman, our, our Congressman, I'm sorry. Uh, um, you have long claimed to be a moderate Republican and are a member of problem uh, and or a member of the Problem solve Solvers Caucus. You as well spent many years in the FBI. Yet you choose now to overlook clear and convincing evidence that the President of the United States is engaged in impeachable conduct. For more than two weeks, we have heard from nonpartisan officials from the Department of the State to the National Intelligence Agencies about the President placing Ukrainian military on aid on hold for personal political gain. And as you worked in the FBI, you know that your Republican colleagues' claim of a deep state is at best a distraction and at worst a falsehood. Okay, so this is going to be really interesting. When you became a congressman, you uh, took an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. The president's behavior is more troubling. 
Um, the president has engaged in bribery, obstruction of justice, violated his oath of office. Well, we ask you now to place country over party and vote in favor of impeachment. Your failure to do so will be a political cop out and forever will stain, will be a stain on you and your party and our nation. So, um, uh, so this is interesting. I, I, the only thing I really find, because to me, I don't know what to make of Trump. I, I, I mean, you can only you can't be the president of the United States if you're not a puppet. If you if you decide you're going to act like a non-puppet, you will get JFK'd. You know, so it's not like um, uh, I have any any faith in, in in the presidency of the United States. I you know it's a I don't believe in the United States. I don't believe in the presidency. I don't believe in any of this thing. It's a, to me, it's just a puppet show. Um, the country marches on towards cultural Marxism, no matter what, who's president, it's the whole thing is just um, a puppet show. And, and, and I believe that Trump was picked because he um, seems like an outsider. Um, and even if he is an outsider, he, he's not allowed to act like one. If he does, he'll get killed. And so it doesn't really matter. It's a moot point who the president is. To me, it's, it's useless. But anyways, they call about the, the deep state um, is a falsehood. So this guy, and now I met, you know, his brother, um, peace be upon him, um, just passed away. Um, and he was the former um, congressman, um, Michael Fitzpatrick. And um, I had met him at, at this, we had a, a local Tea Party candidate. And they sent in, um, they had um, uh, neocon handlers controlling his campaign and so forth. Um, but um, he did get elected. But I remember going to the, um, a fundraiser or a, um, a just a kind of campaign event um, uh, down the road in the country at a big mansion. And the, um, the owner was, um, the husband uh, was away in Tel Aviv at the time. And, but they had this at his house and his wife was there. But um, there was about 100 people there, I guess. And um, um, the congressman asked, you know, is anybody for going into Syria? And nobody was for it. Everybody was against it. And, and I had asked him about the pipeline and all this kind of stuff, and he he wasn't a, really aware of it anyway. He sat, well, sat down and had lunch with me, and um, he uh, <laughs> I, he was saying that he you know gets briefed by the speed the CIA, and you know he I mean. He trusts their information, and, I, I, and I'm thinking, well, and I told him, I said, well, I believe that their CIA is compromised. I mean, CIA, FBI, these were not meant, these are not organizations were ever meant from the get-go to be protecting the populist interests. They, they, there's special interests that they are, international interests that they were, that's why these outfits were created in the first place. You know, if my congressman trusts the CIA, then we're screwed. There's no need, you don't need to have a congressman because you're screwed anyway. It's, it's worthless. And so I don't think this guy, um, his brother, um, is the kind of person that, that can become aware of the deep state, you know, the whole idea that, I mean, that to me, the whole idea is that. The CIA, uh, the, yeah, the CIA, well, the, uh, the FBI, but mostly I'm talking about the Council of Foreign Relations, um, the Federal Reserve, the Trilateral Commission. The, they're the people that actually own and operate the government. That's actually the, sh the, sh the shadow government, you know, deep state. Um, so as long as they're in place, you really it doesn't matter who the president is. You know, you could have, you know, Ron Paul could have won. It wouldn't have mattered. <laughs> I think they were trying to save his life. You know, I guess they felt sorry. You know, he's a, he's a nice guy. He's old. You know, they didn't want to, if he got in there, they'd probably have to assassinate him. You know, so I think that's why they just shut him out. So, you know, from the get go. But um, that's... America, okay, so United States, why I don't believe in America? I don't, I don't believe in um, the Council of Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission and the Federal Reserve and so forth. So how can I be patriotic uh, for uh, a nation that I don't believe in? I can't, you know, it's just, it's not possible. My, my 
So my goal is to start um, spreading the um, seeds of, of secession and the breakup and so that people can go back to before the Union and before even like the early days of um, the settlers uh, when um, the idea was um, uh, self-determination based and you know, back then you know for the most part it was based on um, ideologies and, and common you know beliefs and, and um, people were separating themselves voluntarily and peacefully um, because they know you know they didn't they weren't going to get along that didn't prevent them from trading and so forth but unfortunately what happens is eventually um, people's uh, priorities change and, and you know they get fat and lazy and and they're more interested in making money than um, being honorable honorable and so so here's here's what we get now because you know is how we look at it because um, you know people didn't listen to general Patton and they let the Marxists take over this is <laughs> this is what we got you know this is this is our new this is the you know this is the new um, Western culture you know so this is the okay a line of general neutral dolls um, I cut this out I forget who you know it's the Mattel I think you read okay I'll read the article so here's your general neutral doll, general <laughs> gender neutral and they're um, you know half male and half female okay so this is Okay, each toy kit re retails for thirty dollars. This is a much of, of the article I have. Yeah, Mattel, the toy company, launched Creatable World Dolls line Wednesday. It allows children to create. Uh, this was September two thousand nineteen. It allows children to create what the company calls gender inclusive dolls. Children. Okay, this is what this is what we want our children to be doing, right? So, so as a Christian, you know, do do I want to? Um, do, do I believe in America because this is what this is America no of course I don't believe in America and, and you're not going to change it you notice how how no matter how much conservatives and Christian coalitions and you know Donald Trump's and you know Limbaugh's and Sean Hattie and so forth you know flap their gums the headlong plunge in, in, into into Marxism you know does not deaccelerate whatsoever it just goes on um, uninterrupted so this is why I don't believe in America okay so um, the toys are reflected reflection of the culture as the world continues to celebrate the positive impact of inclusivity okay so um, who is in charge of steering the culture okay so it's a, it's a reflection of the culture remember last in my last video I, I had, had an um, an excerpt from a magazine, an um, um, interview of a, a men's magazine from the 1950s. I don't mean, you know, it was a, cult, cult, uh, a culture one, you know, not like, not Playboy or anything, but anyway, cultural magazine and, and, and the publisher, um, a um, international Jew, was saying that, you know, they hope to be able to use that magazine to steer culture and to change culture. And so it's not a conspiracy theory that there's that these are not grassroots movements that the, you know the, the culture is being um, directed uh, let me see okay we felt it was time to create a doll line free of labels well it's not free of labels it's, <laughs> it's not free of labels it's general neutral that's a label you know you don't get it you know this this um, uh, double speak okay Kim uh, Colmon, senior vice president of Mattel Fashion Doll Design, said uh, in a statement Wednesday through research, we heard that kids don't want their toys dictated by gender norms. <laughs> they heard that from kids. Yeah, I can imagine like a, a little five-year-old girl. Uh, yes, um, uh, say, what would you like, uh, you know, there'd be an interview, what would you like uh, in, in, um, in a doll, uh, you know, Oh, I would like my doll to be um, um, free from gender norms. <laughs> like, you know, this is great. Uh, this line allows all the kids to express themselves freely, which is why it resonates so strongly with them. Oh, yeah, so strongly. 
we're hopeful uh, cre uh, creatable world will encourage people to think more broadly about how all kids can benefit from doll play. The dolls are a departure from some of Mattel's best known creations such as Barbie, which has been criticized for promoting unrealistic beauty standards. Uh, even with tweaks uh, like a more typical body shape uh, and a promotion of STEM-related careers, some of the most popular toys marketed to grade school age children were either um, adults or babies. The Creatable World, um, uh, meanwhile, more closely resembles their pre-adolescent target market. There's no makeup, facial hair, bosoms, or broad shoulders. So not really human, actually. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Uh, all right, let's see. What else? That's really not humans. They're like half male and half female. Like they even, you know, I mean, just because, just because kids, children don't have broad shoulders and, and bosoms and so forth, doesn't and facial hair doesn't mean they're not different for uh, um, male for female. Okay. Um, this is really interesting. Okay, so this is uh, um, something I'm going to read out of um, the Jews for Jesus newsletter. Uh, David Brickner. Uh, two kingdoms, one king. Election year thoughts. Okay. Have you noticed today's political climate is not exactly conductive to spiritual health? For, so, for some, the danger is divisiveness, and others, it's utter despair. Either way, the po political atmosphere can derail us. I won't minimize our civic duty. I hope we all take advantage of our wonderful privilege to vote, but we have a dual citizenship. Consider the promise of Revelation 11:15: The kingdom of this world has become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. God is seated on his throne. He declares uh, the end from the beginning. Okay, we know who wins in the end. The, uh, the chapter points to a powerful scene of break breathtaking worship in heaven while dreadful, seemingly out-of-control wickedness spirals to its ultimate end on earth. What a, a contrast, yet God is about to right all wrongs and all of heaven knows it. This is where we are ultimately headed. Use your vote to support whatever you hope the best outcomes of the November election could possibly be, but can we agree to set our highest hopes well above the fray? Please do not let today's political promises of better tomorrow siphon off your dedication to the kingdom of God today. If believers don't take deliberate steps to resist this temptation, enthusiasm for the ultimate campaign will take a back seat. I'm talking about enthusiasm to make the king of the universe known and to focus on his kingdom not only as described in Revelation, but here and now. Our heavenly citizenship begins as soon as we surrender our hearts to Jesus, and so does our duty and privilege to serve him and his kingdom. I'm asking you to join me in making a, pre a predetermined stand to prioritize the clarion call of the kingdom of Christ over the siren call of the kingdom of this world. We should not withdraw from earthly concerns as we approach the upcoming election, but we need to remember what matters most. Okay, so this is interesting, but he's not really saying anything in terms of what does this mean? See, because this is the confusion that's been this been good confusion that's been part of modern, you know, evangelical Christendom um, for the longest time, and I. I'm going to, this is why I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm a Christian separatist, a Christian um, nationalist, and a Christian um, a theocrat, okay? Um, those are all things that are pretty much taboo in, you know, the modern church, okay? Um, here's, here's the thing, if Christ is really king then, you know, we should be, I think Christians could, should be acting like that. We should say, well, we don't want a president. We want um, somebody who's going to represent Christ, um, not represent 
uh, you know, a plethora of different belief systems. You know, <laughs> that's not a Christian. To me, that's not a Christian worldview. A Christian worldview should be well. We we want we want, and and here's my idea. Here's how it would work: is you would have um, a, a Christian nation is made up of people that are participating voluntarily. And if you have somebody who wants to leave, they can leave. And if you have somebody that wants to come in, well, they're only coming in with the understanding that they're coming into a Christian country. They're not um, permitted to try to influence uh, the direction in, in, of the country in, in any other way. And yeah, that's the way it should be. See, and, and and if you don't like that, go somewhere else. You know, that's to me how you can implement these ideas. That, that he, you know, if because you think about what he's saying, think about what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. Prioritize Christ over the kingdom of this world. Okay. Well, the kingdom of Christ over the king. What? Who is the kingdom of this world? This this brings back. This brings up a really interesting conversation I've been having with my uh, fellow followers of Christ in the house church that I belong to. And it is this idea that um, who really is the kingdom of this world? Okay, what is it? See, it's often confused for some kind of intangible, invisible, you know, completely ethereal kind of feeling of there's some evil kingdom out there somewhere out floating out in heaven or something and we got to fight against that you know and I had taken a big issue with that and I don't think that that's how that's how Jesus and, and, and the apostles thought about it okay there's this thing that goes around also in, in, in the Christian world of like Jesus was really only angry at the religious leaders of his time. You know, everybody else, he, you know, extended an olive branch, you know, <laughs> and, you know, everybody else was sort of like, okay, um, you know, fear not, go, you know, you're forgiven and, you know, blah, 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 and that kind of thing. And, but the religious leaders, and I think that that, and what they mean by that, they're thinking that if Jesus was here now, the only people we'd have a problem with are pastors, and televangelists and theologians, and, you know, and I don't think that's really the correct interpretation of what Jesus, what was really going on there with the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees. And I'll tell you why I say this, because the scribes and the Pharisees were really like the equivalent, the first century equivalent of the Anti-Defamation League. They were the ones that say, hey, look, if you believe on this guy, uh, you'll be kicked out of the synagogue. You know, your name will be trashed. You know, we'll, 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 we'll um, entice an angry crowd like the Antifa and, uh, you know, have you stoned to death or, you know, beat to death in the streets. That's the kingdom of this world. That's the kingdom that Jesus, you know, that's the kingdom of Satan. That's the, who describes the Pharisees represented as, as far as I'm concerned. I think that's the right way to interpret this. And so we have the same enemies now that Jesus had in the, 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 um, roaming the face of our planet. Um, they uh, are the people who um, saw to it that the Romans uh, you know crucified Christ. They, 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 they're the ones that saw to it that the Romans, because they didn't have the authority to do it themselves, they saw to it that the Romans and the various angry mobs, I mean, they did sometimes take, they didn't always, you know, stay within the bounds of, the, of, the, of their law at the time. I mean, they, they um, didn't hesitate to stone people to death if they didn't like what they're saying. And, um, um, and these are the people now who are currently the same elk, the elk that um, uh, is in charge of the Antifa and these doxing organizations that want to try to um, uh, get you fired and you know lose your job and your livelihood and, and, and because they don't like the fact that you're interested in the truth. 
you're a truther of some sort. Um, you know, th these are the these are the same people. That's cool. <laughs> There's my disco sign in the background. These are the same people that um, uh, you know are, are roaming the face of the earth today. They're the ones that the, the neo Marxists. These are the Marxists. These are the ones uh, who started World War One, World War Two. They're the ones that did 9/11. They're the people that own the Council of Foreign Relations, uh, the Federal Reserve, and the, uh, the uh, Trilateral Commission. Uh, this is the kingdom of Satan. These are the people that Jesus was, you know, opposed to. And, and these are so. When I read about, you know, the kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of Satan and, and the king, king of this world, so I don't, I don't think. That, you know, the kingdom of, of heaven is some invisible thing also, and the kingdom of Satan is some invisible thing. That both these things have realities on earth. And as, as the people of, of Jesus are the body of Christ, and I believe the people who are following uh, these satanic um, dictates are the body of Satan. Um, and I know that's not a commonly used theological language, but I'll use it anyways. Um... This is kind of. I guess I'll save this. I'll save this to the end. I'll, I, I don't want to keep reiterating the same thing. All in one bunch. I'll spread it out a little bit. Um, okay, this is kind of neat. This is. Uh, okay. This is New York Times, of course, and you know they're they're always you know, bashing the far right. You know, it's the kingdom of Satan against it. Because, uh, for the most part, you know, the far right wants to see righteousness prevail in the land. Uh, Rome, a grassroots movement protesting the populism of the far right Italian leader uh, Matteo Salvini, uh, demonstrated its surging strength on Saturday, drawing tens of thousands of people in the square. And so I don't think this is um, a grassroots movement personally. I think that I doubt this, but it could be um, a simple, you know, a group of people who all belong to uh, a particular, um, like, kind of like that thing I was showing you at the beginning, this, you know, demo, the, um, where was that thing? Here it is. Ah. Kind of like this, the Democratic Jewish Outreach of Pennsylvania, so like the Democratic Jewish Outreach in, Italy, in Rome, you know. Um... The Sardines, they call it the Sardine Movement, uh, um, named for its ability to pack piazzas, reflects uh, general uh, disgust among many a liberal Italian over Mr. Salvini's anti-migrant and anti-European language. Well, how can you be anti-migrant and anti-European? You see, <laughs> that you're either pro-European and anti-migrant. Now, what they mean by European, they mean European Union. In other words... They're anti this idea that there's one little handful of people that are going to control the entire Europe. Uh, these um, kingdom of synagogue of Satan control freaks, they don't want that. Something has already changed in the...